All right. So then I guess uh, last time, you know, we, where we ended up was basically, so we'd solve the steady state. Okay. Which, which essentially amounts to finding either P or R, depending on whether you want to, you know, they're, they're equivalent, basically. Uh, you can, you can find that. And then once you found <clears throat> the steady state labor allocation, you can find the growth rate just by multiplying R by gamma. Okay. And then that's in some sense you're done. I mean, so I, it, you know, what the, what the equilibrium variable is, is not, you know, it's not one thing it's, it's, everything is co-determined, but, um, <clears throat> usually the growth rate is sort of, uh, what I would think about as the final output. Okay. So, um, and in this case, you know, the growth rate and R are just, are intricately linked. Yeah. It's just gamma times R for the growth rate. That's because we are in a phi equals one world. Okay. If we were not in a phi equals one world, well then things would be more complicated. Um, but there would still be some relationship. It just wouldn't be so simple. Okay. So this is, this is why phi equals one is, is good because it's easier. All right. So that you could just map linearly between, uh, or very simply between, um, a labor allocation in terms of research and a growth rate. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, I guess I did want to just sort of circle back to so we, I mean, we, I was a little bit rushed at the end. Okay. Um, in terms of what the outcome was. Okay. So let me just pop the slides open here. Like, so this, these are the slides. Okay. And let me, let me jump to the, the iPad. Okay. So, so this is sort of like where we ended up last time. Okay. And this is in terms of P the, the production allocation. Okay. I think in the, in the slides that I ended up switching over to the, the research allocation. So that's one thing. Um, but it's all, I mean, so, if, you know, you can convert easily between them, right? If you want. So just from here, we know that P dot is going to be minus R dot, right? Because one equals P plus R, any change <clears throat> in the value of uh, P must be counterbalanced by a change in the value of R. So we can do that. And then it's just sort of, uh, plug it in here. So then this becomes one minus R and this becomes one minus R minus P star. Okay. Um, and then, uh, the last thing you do is okay, well, this is, this is one minus R. So one minus R minus P star, one minus P star is R is what we're going to call R star. Okay, so the, the, the if you have steady state P, you get steady state R just by doing one minus. So this is R star minus R. Okay, um, and then I think that's it. So so and I mean, uh, let's let's also throw that negative sign over the other side. Okay, so this will be minus here. Um, this whole thing. Okay, and then yeah, I mean. Uh, whether it's one minus R, the opposite doesn't matter. Okay, so this, you can seamlessly basically convert between the P equation and the R equation because it has a similar relationship. Okay, and so then um, if we draw that graph, okay, well, it's gonna look very similar. I guess what, what is, what, it's gonna be kind of a, a mirror image in some sense. Okay, so, um, but let's, let's do that. Okay, so if we think about R, oh no, I shouldn't do that. If we think about R is our, thing on the x-axis is our x variable. That's still ranging between zero and one, just like P. Okay. Um, and then we're going to think about our dot here. Okay. So then for that, uh, okay. Where did the zero out? It zeroes out at R equals one. Okay. We can see that. And then, um, it zeroes out at, at R star. Okay. So it's some point R star. Okay. And then it's, um, Okay, so we can also write this. If you invert both of these quadratic forms at once, it doesn't change anything because you get two minus sides. Okay, so we can also write it like that. Okay, um, so you can see basically what's the what's the shape of the uh, the concave function. Okay, so that on that r squared term, there's going to be a minus sign. Okay, so this is a, a negative uh, a concave uh, function going in, in either direction. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to draw it like this from the right side because that's just how I'm going to do it. All right. And so it should be like relatively well ordered. Okay. So that should be quadratic and that's, that's what we're going to get there. Okay. And then, um, <clears throat> I guess let's, let's make this, uh, potentially negative. Okay. So this is zero here. Okay. 
um, and then this is also zero. Okay, so um, and then if you think about it at zero, it's going to be something. Okay, so so it's actually going to intersect. Okay, um, all right. So that's that's our uh, that's our situation there. All right, and so I guess what it what it ended up being rotating at 180 degrees, I think would be the statement because we flip the axis horizontally and vertically. I, I'm not good with rotations, but let's say that it's rotating at 180 degrees. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so, you know, it, it, it's equivalent, right. Um, to think about either way, uh, okay, let's draw that. Okay. So then, um, now that, and then in terms of the dynamics, it's the same story that we told last time. Okay. Which is that, uh, First of all, this is unstable, that R star is unstable, okay? Uh, if you start above it, you're gonna keep shooting up until you get to R equals one, which means P equals zero, which means output is going to zero because why is output going to zero? So in principle, remember Y is equal to P times N to the one over epsilon minus one, okay? that uh, you've got just a pure production. Let me make sure that that almost looks like a G. That's a Y. So you have pure production labor that just goes in linearly because there's sort of a CRS argument. And then N is the, the what's called the love of variety. Okay, uh, people people like variety. I don't know if they love it, they like it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a good thing to, to spread out your labor amongst an increasingly large set of goods because of the way we constructed things, all right? Um, okay, so then the idea is, well, if we go to R equals one, we're gonna get pretty good growth, um, but we're also gonna have very, you know, we're gonna be using almost no production labor, okay? So the question is what happens? Because N is gonna be growing still at, at a fairly high rate, uh, and then P is gonna be collapsing, okay? So, um, well, we need to figure that out, all right? So, but we, but we can do that. All right, and you know, we just need to kind of think about the limiting behavior. And this is important, sort of. I mean, it's not important in the sense that, you know, we know R star is at equilibrium, but we're trying to show that, okay? And in particular, we're trying to show that when you go to R equals one, it, it actually is sort of bad, okay? And it's gonna be bad in the way that Y output is gonna be collapsing. And so consumption is gonna be collapsing and, and that's gonna ruin your transversality condition, basically, okay? Um, if consumption collapses, your your Lagrange multi, your Hamiltonian multiplier explodes, and yeah, okay. So um, let let's we but you, we can work through the the limiting behavior. Okay, when when R goes to one, okay, what happens is Y. Okay, so we know that G Y just from taking the growth rate here is G P plus uh, G. We'll call it over epsilon minus one. Okay. Um, so this is like, you know, we're trying to figure this out. Okay, so then we know that, all right. Um, we know what is what is G gonna look like? Remember in general, G is gamma times R. Okay, so then in this case, it would be gamma. We're gonna hit the, that's the maximum possible growth rate you can have. If you put all of your research into, uh, all of your labor into research, you get a growth rate of gamma, okay. That's just from our um, our production. You know, if you look at the the production function for ideas <clears throat> here, n dot equals gamma n times r. That means that n dot over n is gamma r. Okay, and so then you just get that your maximal growth rate is gamma. Now, oh, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so max we're gonna have g equals gamma. All right, um, that's one thing. Let's keep that in our back pocket. Now, what's what's GP? Well. We can actually use this equation up here at the top to figure out what is what does GP look like in that limiting case. So when R goes to one, P goes to zero. All right, when it, which which presents some issues here because um, we have a P. So we, we, if you just plug in P equals zero, you get P dot equals zero. But really, we should think about that as P dot over P. Move that P over, you get gamma epsilon over epsilon minus one, and then p minus uh, p star, okay? All right, and then in this case, um, 
when, when R equals one, capital P equals zero. All right, so that growth rate GP, this is GP, it's gonna be minus P star times gamma epsilon over epsilon minus one, just plugging in P equals zero in that equation. That's gonna be our, our GP, okay? Now, what was P star? Well, I don't remember. Um, I mean, I kind of remember, but I don't exactly remember, but that's gonna be on the previous page. So let's just jump over here. What was P star? Surely we solved for P star. Or maybe we didn't. Oh, no, we did. Um, so did I not like at all at any point write down what P star was? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's rho, yeah, rho plus gamma over gamma, this, this here. Okay. So rho plus gamma over gamma, um, and then times epsilon over epsilon so on. Okay. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's copy that. Um, Yes, the lasso. Yeah. All right. I don't know why I need to make a whole rodeo. Wait, wait, okay, wait. You want me to do a more? That was that was a little like y'all. Oh, you want me to have a, a a soundboard? Um. Yeah. Um. And 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 frankly, the yaw was a little. It it was low energy. I'll admit it. Uh, I spent yaw. Um. So, yeah, that way, that way we're really done. So this, this is a proper rodeo. Um, now I'm from New Jersey. Well, I was born in New Jersey, so I don't think I have any right to do a proper rodeo. But still, uh, let's let's see. Then oh, okay, all right. Well, that's that's the secret. Rodeos actually aren't fun. Um, yeah, it's probably a lot of just sitting around waiting for things to happen, which is most of life. Let's face it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll get a soundboard. I'm, I, I like that. I've been looking for a reason to do that. Actually, it reminds me of uh, the hya that I just gave you. Was I think it was it was a Simpsons inspired one. Uh, this is older. I mean, I'm, I'm I, I as you know, I'm old, so uh, I'm, I've probably seen more of the older Simpsons episode. But there was an episode where they had um, a car called a Canyon Arrow, uh, which was like this absurd. It was making fun of American car culture, where the cars are extremely large. Okay. Uh, like these Chevy Suburbans and such. So, but this one, they, they had a, a commercial for it. Uh, you should, you can look, if you look up Canyon Arrow commercial and Simpsons, you can, this, this is your, your homework for today. Um, but, but they have a, a song, like a commercial with a song and it's a guy singing. And I remember the Lord's, it's like three lanes wide, 50 feet high, 65 tons of American pride, something like that. Absurd to like, you know, this thing, is like a, a giant tank, even bigger than a tank. So, so that's the, the joke, but then also it's like a guy with sort of a Southern drawl or a Texan drawl. And he says, yeah, like that. So I would go check that out and then maybe I'll go check it out and copy that y'all and then make it, it's like some kind of soundboard thing. That's my homework and your homework is to watch it. Okay. All right. So we did that. We're going to copy it and then we're going to move it over here. Now that we've lasted it. All right. Uh, paste. Okay, cool. All right. That was a lengthy aside, but we have P star now. Okay, so um, why did we need P star though? That's the question. Now we we uh, we wanted we wanted to get P star so that we could plug it in up here. Okay, sorry I'm jumping around a lot. Okay, but this was our GP equation. Oops, I'm still in like I'm still in lasso mode. We, we need to write things now. Okay, so this is our GP equation here up top. Okay, and when it's uh, when GP sorry when P is zero. GP is going to be gamma epsilon over epsilon minus one times P star times minus one. Okay, so let's, when when we have that, we're going to get minus um, gamma epsilon over epsilon minus one. And you can see things are going to cancel times P star. Okay, so, and now we have P star. And in fact, things many things cancel. So gamma's cancel. The epsilon ratio cancels because it's inverted in p star. Okay, and so we're left with all. Oh, we're left with this minus rho plus gamma. Okay, so that's that's a good sign. If things cancel, it's always a good sign. Um, all right, then we just have to plug that in. Okay, so what, what about, we know we know both parts of this equation: minus rho plus gamma. Okay, and then plus gamma over epsilon minus one. 
Okay. Um, and let's combine some terms. Okay, so this is going to be uh, minus, I say, I'm going to say we're going to have a minus there, a row. And then that plus, if we move it into the minus, it becomes a minus, and we're going to get you know plus uh, gamma times epsilon over epsilon minus 1. That should be true. Let me think. Um, is that going to be true? Oh, man, yeah. Uh, let's ponder. So it's it's a uh, one. It might it might actually be the opposite, two minus epsilon. Well, let's not do that. Let's let's okay. We we need to sign. Okay, what I want to do is sign this thing. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. What I want to do is sign this thing. Okay, now you know this this um. It has a negative term clearly, but it also has a positive term. It's a little ambiguous, but I believe the ticket here is to consider uh, P star, okay? Um, let's consider P star. Uh, so, so we have that P star is less, we want P star to be less than one. That's, I, di I didn't say that before. We're gonna that we we do end up with a, a particular condition saying that that we end up at an interior value for p star, okay? Because um, if you look at the the value for p star, it's it's something that's greater than one times something that is less than one, okay? So the rho rho plus gamma over gamma is is, is greater. Than, it's one plus rho over gamma. The epsilon minus one over epsilon, that's less than one. There's nothing saying which one wins out. Okay, so we, we need a condition there to say that this thing is less than one. Okay. Um okay, so and we're just okay, that, that's our condition. Okay, P, P star is less than one, therefore, you know, that's less than one. We can make it prettier if we want, but that's that's our condition. Okay. Um and and if if we can use this condition, right? If, if we rearrange it a bit, so let's jump down here. Uh, we want to. I mean, we want to rearrange it as um, relating rho plus gamma and gamma over epsilon minus one, because those are both in there somewhere. But there's an extra factor of epsilon. Okay, so, but but we know that epsilon is greater than one, so that's going to be helpful. All right. So if we rearrange this, we're going to get. Uh, let's let's do. This is saying that rho plus gamma. Okay, is less than. Well, basic, you know, you can write it as one over epsilon times, uh, sorry, epsilon times uh, gamma over epsilon minus one. Okay. Um, okay, so the question is, does that help? Possibly not. Let me ponder. So, I wonder if I missed the term somewhere. Okay, so GP. Let me just let me just double check our our, our math here. For GP, we got gamma epsilon over epsilon minus one times p star. That's P star, that's right. And then um let me check one thing here. Yeah, maybe maybe it does depend on that. I, I thought for some reason I thought this was going to be unambiguous, but yeah, maybe it just de it depends on on another condition. Um, okay, so the issue here is you know if 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 you look at, let's 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 just do sort of a meta analysis here. If this was if this wasn't here, then then we'd be all set, right? Uh, and and but and so so the the problem though is that our, what we actually want you know gamma over epsilon minus one. Is is in, is 
is in between basically rho plus, uh, let's see, yeah, rho plus gamma and epsilon times gamma over epsilon minus one. So um, it, it, it's not possible to, to use this thing to sign the thing on the left, okay? So um, let me let me think, I don't wanna to spend too much time on it. Obviously it's something either it's not signable, okay? In which case, I guess we need to think about it a little bit more or I just like missed a term somewhere. Um, I don't think I missed a term. Um, Well, even even when it's so, um, let's see. I mean, even even knowing two may not be enough. I mean, I think I think the the problem here is that this condition on the left is just a different condition. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Then it's yeah. That is correct. So, so yeah, so if we combine these, we're going to get gamma. Let's see, one minus, is it, I think it's two minus epsilon, or epsilon. Okay, yeah. All right, so if, yeah, so you're saying if, if epsilon is less than two, that thing is, is unambiguously negative. Yeah. Is it greater than two? So let's do, I, th I think it's less than two. I think it's less than two. So if it's between zero and one, that's negative. Once it gets greater than two, then it becomes a little hard to say. Um, now, it, okay. Uh, that, and, and that may, you know, that may not be an issue because here, here's what we do know. Um, what do we know? Yeah, I mean, okay, so so it, it may be okay if if Y is is doing that. I think um, it does complicate things. Let me let me okay. Let me think about it um, a little bit. More and see how it depends on on the exact value of epsilon. Okay, because essentially, if y is truly going to zero, then we're uh, we're kind of all set. We can we can um, plug that into a uh, depending, well depending on the rate, we can plug that into the transversality condition and show that there's some uh, issue with the the multiplier because it, essentially the the transversality condition you get um, the multiplier which is u prime if you have an anodic condition. And consumption is going to zero. That's going to blow up and and cause some issues. Okay, so um, but it's apparently it's comp more complicated than I anticipated. Okay, so that's what's happening. But I'll I'll, I'll come back to you guys next time with, with hopefully a proper answer for that. Okay, so that's what's happening on the on the one side. Potential transversality issues. The the zero side is actually much easier because we know that we're going to blow through feasibility. Okay, uh, as you know here when you're when you're heading down to the negative. So when you're heading up here. To one, you're 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 doing it proportionate to uh, one minus r or r minus one, so you're you're gonna you're 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 gonna sort of approach it but not blow through it one. Okay, on this side you're just going negative and that's it, right? You just go right through zero. Okay, and you can't you can't you have negative uh, r and d. Okay, so um, that's easy. All right, and and uh, you know we know that at uh, zero, that thing is negative, and it's it's not close to zero. It's bounded away from zero. It's zero set. All right, so um, that side is, is much easier. Okay, so then once we have that, we sort of if we show that neither uh, neither outcome can happen, and because of the instability, then it must be that we're at our star. Okay, so that's that's sort of the argument there. Okay, um, we we're not gonna in general. You know, it's it's the thing about this that the dynamics are it it is tricky. Okay, as we've seen, um, but it, we're not. It's not a big deal because we almost always just find that you you start exactly 
in steady state, basically. There are no transitional dynamics like in a, in a solo or a Ramsey model, okay? And essentially the reason is there's no scale. Uh, you know, there's no units on N. So if, if N is a million versus a billion versus four, there's nothing you can say about that, right? Um, so it's, in some sense, there's no state at all, okay? There's no state. If there was something for N to be relative to perhaps, then we could start talking, but there really isn't, okay? Um, and there's no uh, persistence, okay, of, of your past choices, right? You just pile up new products and that's it, right? Uh, and so, it, you know, later on, you know, when we started adding in more details, maybe we'll, we will get persistence, okay? So for instance, um, here, the, the notion of a new product is you create a new product, you got a patent for it, the patent lasts forever, you have the monopolist forever, okay? And you get new products coming in that, that effectively will compete with you, um, but uh, you don't get any direct competition, all right? Now, if you had a situation where uh, you did uh, uh, have patents that expired, okay, that would be a state. That would introduce a notion of a state because you'd create the product and then at some point the patent would expire, you'd move from being a monopolist to, to basically it's just a sort of competitively produced, okay, with zero profits. Um, and so in that case, if you had been producing, if you, if you had our high, really high R&D in the past you know, few years, that's going to produce a lot of patented products, even, you know, as, as a proportion of the total number of products. Uh, and then that's going to, but then if you go back down to a normal level, that's going to slowly converge back to sort of some equilibrium. So that type of persistence can introduce states, but, but with a pure sort of technology scale free parameter, like N, you're not going to get um, dynamics. Okay. So, uh, but, but in, in, for most of the models that we'll do, we're, we're not going to have dynamics because uh, we're, the, the, adding in the third finding like pet stuff like that is, is complicated. Uh, so, so we're, we're going to do sort of the baseline case in general. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, so that, so that's the, the, but those are how we can think about dynamics. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is, well, you know, thinking about back to steady state. Okay. Uh, is really just like, what, what are the forces at play here? Okay. What, you know, we went through a bunch of equations. Okay. But and it's all pretty messy, all right? So, so maybe there's some way we can kind of distill this, all right? And so the way I like to do it is to, to look at basically your free entry condition. The free entry condition is the point at which everything hangs together, all right? And and we can, I think I think there's a way um, to do this that you can kind of see at least what, what, what's, what are the forces, okay? And so let's start a new page here. So um, this is sort of like, you know, some back to sort of equilibrium. All right, steady state, I guess, but I'll just write equilibrium. Um, so our notion of equilibrium is what? So in the well, in the most abstract sense, it's the rate of new products. Uh, and let's see. Well, wait, whatever for, for the free entry condition, we wrote you know gamma, and uh, basically gamma n should be equal to w. Okay, so but let me let me start with this and then sort of work backwards. So this is, what this is saying is basically, this is like a marginal benefit. Sorry, I forgot the V, the V is important. Gamma and V should be equal to W. Um, that's right. Okay, so what this is saying is, you got a researcher, all right? They, they can, and they can do research. Oh, you have a worker. They can do research, okay? And if they do research, their marginal effect, right, through this production function, which is gamma n r, their marginal effect is to produce gamma n products, okay? All right, so that's why we have gamma n there. And if they do successfully produce a product that has a value r, private value, uh, sorry, a v, has a private value v. So then their, their marginal benefit of working in research is gamma times n times v, all right? Now, um, you guys know this, if, you look, if you're in Pittsburgh and you look up, sometimes there's a four engine planes, KC-135 aerial, aerial refueler. Check it out. They're very cool because uh, there's an Air Force base here. That, sorry, I just looked out the window, got distracted. So that's the marginal benefit, uh, gamma n v. Now, you, you're a worker. You can be a researcher or you can be a production worker, okay? Uh, if you're a production worker, you just get wage W. It, it's a simple life, you know, you go to work, punch in, punch out, get your wage W, okay? Um, 
And so that's really the choice, right? That's that's the equilibrium notion is that you have workers, right? You have this constraint one equals P plus R and you need to allocate those workers, okay? And the, the private market generates some profit uh, firm outcomes, okay? Uh, which generates value, profits and values, okay? And then you can then figure out what's the value of the new firm, run that through your ideas production function and figure out what's the marginal benefit of in expectation of doing research, okay? Um, and then the, the on the production side, it's much simpler. You just go in and you get a wage W, okay? So <clears throat> the, um, but, but, but you can also, and so that's, um, let's see, that's sort of like the op marginal opportunity cost of going from, let's see, of, of going from, of taking a worker out of production and putting them in research. Right, so the benefit is you get the same product and the value associated with that. And the cost is that you don't do production. Okay, so you can think about it as a marginal benefit, marginal cost calculation. The other way you can think about it, which is more or less equivalent, is just that you have some research wage. Okay, you, you effectively give the, the entire product of doing research to the researcher themselves. Okay, so you can think about that as their wage. <clears throat> and then you have some production wage, which is really just W. Okay, the production wage is W. Okay, that's what, that, that's what the workers get paid. And those two should be equal because you can choose either one. If they weren't equal, then, then everyone would do one or the other, depending on which, which wage was higher. Okay, so this is also, you, sometimes people call that the law of one price. Okay, um, although I, I don't like, I don't in general like calling things laws. I mean, it's sort of a result of a competitive outcome. But, you know, given that people can choose freely, there should be a common price between these two things. Okay. Um, so that's that you can there these are equivalent interpretations the, the mb equals mc versus the the uh price equilibration or the wage equilibration um or equalization uh but yeah so that's how you can think about it right now let's let's you know so this one is sort of more we can we can we can work at this one okay um and, and we can even uh sort of quickly just just plug things in to see how, how everything's going to pan out okay so um Let's let's iteratively plug things in. So we're gonna start with V. We'll plug in like pi over R minus GV, and then we know what pi is. We'll plug that in, and then we can we can work from there. Okay, so we're gonna have gamma, and let's plug in for V. So that's gonna be pi over R minus GV. Remember we found this before, just in a in a very general sense. Okay, if you have a, have a, a profit stream pi, uh, and uh, you can write it kind of you know in this way where you just the, your discount rate is R minus GV. Okay, um, and that's going to be still equal. To, let's just leave it as W for now. Okay, um, and then the other thing we found. Okay, let me just this this. I'm just going to pull this out of the notes. Basically, is the profit. Okay, so the profit. Um, well, okay. So so let me. I'll put these sort of things that we're using on the side. Remember the, so the pi was the the v was uh, pi over r minus gv. Okay, and then pi we found. A while ago is WP over epsilon minus one times N. Okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna plug that in. Okay, that came from basically the production side. We're gonna plug that in on the left, okay, and see what see what happens. Okay, so we're gonna gamma N times what one over let's keep this separate, R minus G V times uh WP over epsilon minus one times N. So equal to W, okay. All right, so so I, I mean, I'm basically solving it at this point, but uh, I'm not gonna solve it fully. I, I'm gonna sort of plot it instead, okay. So um, what do we have here? Well, uh, first of all, th some things are gonna cancel. The ends are gonna cancel. The W's, I'm gonna, let's, let's just cancel the W's on both sides, okay. Um, all right, and so then we're left with what? We're, we're gonna get gamma P, over r minus gv is going to be equal to one. Okay, so so the so we we canceled w, which is it's kind of cheating. Okay, I'm, I'm canceling things on two sides, but in some sense th this is saying the left hand side is like the the marginal benefit. Okay, and the right hand side is the marginal cost in terms of like workers. Okay, which is just going to be one. Okay, so you you, you 
use one worker, okay? And then the, the left, um, that's, the, the, so that's the marginal cost on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, it's sort of the, the benefit of one single worker, okay? Um, and the last thing we, we haven't actually plugged in for, but is, is GV, okay, so let me pull that in, okay? Um, Where'd that go? Where'd you go, GV? There we go. Um, I, I'm also going to write this over on the right hand side. So this is all, you know, remember I said this is it. Many people gave their lives to produce these results. Okay. Uh, but we're going to get something like this. Okay. Um, and actually, we're in steady state. So GP is zero. So this is just row plus G. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to plug that into, this is, this is, uh, we're basically there. Okay. And this, so this is going to be gamma P over rho G again is equal to one. Move that up. Okay. And what I really want to get is a marginal benefit thing in terms of P or in terms of R and then compare that to a marginal cost of one. Okay, so, and then I, and then I kind of want to plot it. Okay, so let's, let's, I guess we should think of, well, I don't know, um, should we do P or R? Uh, let's do R, okay? So, you know, if, and, and so you, if we want to make this in terms of R, okay? Uh, so this is gonna be what, gamma one minus R on top instead of P, okay? And then we're also going to have rho plus gamma r. Okay. And then, you know, that should be equal to one. Okay. So th this is, th we basically just solved that. I mean, you could solve that to find r. Okay. And that's going to give you a steady state, the same one that we got before. Okay. Uh, but you can also see, you know, essentially what's happening, okay, is... Um, you're, if you think about plotting this, okay, so, so think about the left-hand side as, as sort of a marginal benefit and the right-hand side as the marginal cost, okay? So the marginal benefit at R equals zero here, okay, is just going to be gamma over rho. If you plug in R equals zero, you're going to get gamma over rho, okay? And it's going to decrease with R, Okay. Going to decrease with R, and, and as R gets to one, it's going to hit zero. Let's say it looks like that. Okay. Um, and then uh, you're going to have some one point there. Uh, what happened to epsilon? Did I, I forgot about epsilon? That's why, because there should be an epsilon. You know, if you look at that last equation, there's no epsilon. That would mean that R is not a function of epsilon, which is not the case. So I missed this. If you look at the top there, that one over epsilon minus one. I accidentally uh, dropped it. Okay, so let's add it back in. It doesn't really change anything. So that's one over epsilon minus one here. And then, uh, yeah, so then one over epsilon minus one. Okay, and that also means that this is gamma, well, you know, one over epsilon minus one times gamma over rho, which is the opposite of what I wrote. Okay, so that, okay, we, we, we resurrected one over epsilon minus one. Okay, um, and now that's, that's our starting point. It's gonna decrease. Now that marginal cost is just constant. Okay, that's pretty simple. That one. Okay. All right, and then this is our sort of no goes on here. All right, so so that that you can think about it as sort of like there's a marginal benefit and a marginal cost. Okay, and and because I divided by w, I kind of this is I kind of tilted the axes a little bit such that the marginal cost is sort of constant. Okay, you're just giving up one worker, and the question is what is giving up that one worker? do for the marginal benefit in terms of, uh, you know, basically profits and firm value, 
Okay, and this is a private notion, right? This is this is a private marginal benefit, private marginal cost. Socially, things may be different. Okay, when we solve the social finance problem, they may be different. Okay, but but and so what's happening? Well, um, uh, when you put more into research, okay, first of all, when you put more into research, you increase the growth rate. If you increase the growth rate, you're going to increase the interest rate. Okay, through the consumer side, right? Because you want the consumers to actually consume what is being produced. So you need to increase the interest rate so that they want to match that that uh, pat, that uh, production path with their consumption. Okay, um, that's going to then feed into the firms who are facing a higher interest rate. Okay, which is going to lower that marginal benefit. Okay, so that that's that's basically that that G minus R V or the R minus G V term. That's that's why you end up with the decreasing function there. Okay, um, and then on, at the same time on the pro, on the pure profit side. Okay, there's you know if you have more, let's see if you have, you have more research, you have less production going into those firms. Okay, and so they're going to be less profitable. Okay, so. Those and so you can see the the, the the sort of the one minus r on top and the one uh, one over uh, rho plus gamma are both negative effects. Okay, so that's unambiguous, and that and so that oops, that's going to give you, you know, a purely decreasing function with an intersection, and in fact, that intersection is just going to be r star. You solve for you get the same thing. Okay, so so you can think about this as as sort of a marginal benefit, marginal cost thing. Okay, and, and the way I did it here, because I, again, because I cancelled the w's, maybe it's not the best way because. The, the other option would have been up here if instead we said, okay, well, what if we didn't cancel W? What if we plugged in for W instead and, and, and got the true, because, because anytime you cancel stuff on both sides, you kind of, you, you tilt your, what you're thinking about in some ways. Okay. So it might've been better to plug in for W, but the problem is that W is not, well, W is not the worst thing in the world actually um but actually it wouldn't yeah i don't, I don't think it would change things much, that much but it's something to, to, to be cognizant of okay so um all right so the, yeah i mean i, I it, when we get to the uh social planner okay we can do the same thing we, except with with uh you know if, if we call these you know private marginal benefit private marginal cost we can write social marginal benefits and social marginal costs and think about how are those different okay and the big question is do do profits of the firms line up or the values i guess of the firms line up with the social benefits that they're actually producing okay that's the question you know is it, the, the whole point of this profit mechanism is to reward firms for increasing technology which increases output in the long run or i mean in the short run in the long run so uh and the question is do, do these line up and, and they don't they don't line up perfectly. They, they're clearly related, okay? Uh, but they're not gonna line up perfectly, which is gonna produce some sort of inefficiencies uh, in the outcome, okay? So let's um, let's do that. Let's let's solve the social planners problem, okay? Now I say it's so bad, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm I, this is, I, I didn't have time to put this into the slides that's in the, the long form notes, okay? But, um, it's not so bad, but let me pull that up just to make sure I don't go too far off the, the tracks here. All right. Uh, so what, what are we going to need? We need, okay, so social planner. Okay, so what's the social planner do? They're actually, they're solving a much simpler problem in some sense. They're take, they have a state variable in some sense, which is N. That's fully describes basically the state of the world at any given time. And they have a choice, which let's say is, is R. It could also be P. That's R. It could be G too. So that's a choice. And that's this is how I'm framing it in the in the notes too. So um so that's a choice variable. So that's it's pretty standard, right? So you have a state variable, you got a choice variable. Um and these have certain implications. Okay, so in particular, um you're gonna have, you know. We know we, we showed before so it so we well we showed before that if you have in this symmetric setting where you you allocate um, production labor equally across all goods 
that your production is going to look like this. You know, uh, P times N to the 1 over epsilon minus 1. Okay. Now, if you're the social planner, well, we haven't exactly shown that you would want to allocate uh, production labor equally across all goods. It stands to reason that you might want to, um, but we, ha we haven't necessarily shown that. Okay, so in some sense, you might say, well, actually, your choice is all the LIs and how much research you're doing, subject to the constraint that this all kind of adds up. Right? That that that's the full statement, I guess, of your choice. Okay. Um, it turns out that you're going to want to choose the same ally for everyone. It's still a totally symmetric problem from the standpoint of the social planner. Okay. And if you have a symmetric problem like that, so long as your 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 um, objective function is so concave, or I guess convex in a way, convex optimization, um, you're not going to want to go to extremes. You're, you're going to want to equalize things. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we could, well, I don't know. We, we could solve, you, you can go through and solve the full problem, but, but we kind of know that the answer is going to be you're going to choose a common LI. Okay, that you're going to choose um, basically LI is equal to P over N like that. Okay. So let's just do that. I mean, if we, you know, if we, if we're born later, maybe we can go back and, and do the full problem, but, but we know that there's going to be a symmetric outcome. Okay. So then if that's true, that implies this basically. Okay. And we know that consumption is equal to output. Okay. And we know that we have a utility function of some sort. Okay. So, so we have a mapping from our, our state and, and choice R slash P and those are equivalent um, into output and hence consumption, plug that into the utility function and that gives us our objective. Okay. So we, so we basically know, we know what our objective value is. We also know how uh, the state is evolving, right? And that is gamma and R. You know, that, that's a, the only a function of our, our state variable and our choice variable. Okay, um, right, and so this is you know, one minus r times, right? So we, we know um, our, our objective, we know how our state evolves, so, so we're all set. Okay, so we can write down a Hamiltonian. It's all in. Okay, so our Hamiltonian is, what's well, u of c, okay? All right, and we found c, we, we found what c should look like, which is one minus r under the one over epsilon minus one, all that, okay. Um, and then we're gonna have our, our Hamiltonian multiplier times the derivative of the state variable, right, which is gamma and r. Okay, so it's the objective plus mu times n dot, which is gamma and r. Okay, so that's it, all right, that's our Hamiltonian. Um, and that from there, I mean, we're just using sort of standard uh, techniques uh, to, to solve it, okay? Um, things kind of pan out similarly to uh, uh, how, how they work in, in a, say, a Ramsey-style optimization, okay? So that's not too bad. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, as long as you keep your head on straight, you, you can take the appropriate derivatives and get through it. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so uh, so we're gonna get an R equation, right? The derivative with respect to R should be equal to zero, and then we're gonna get some mu related uh, derivative with respect to n. Okay, so we want zero is equal to H R. Okay, um, so we're gonna get we're gonna get well, we're gonna get a minus as a minus on that R mu prime of C or sorry U prime of C. Okay, and then we're going to pick up that n to the 1 over epsilon minus 1. Okay, so that's going to be our derivative with respect to r for the first term. And the second term, we're going to get mu gamma n. Okay, so that's that's it there. We can, um, yeah, we can 
simplify this a little bit. Okay, I mean, but if we want to, so we can combine the end terms uh, if we would like. Um, that's going to give us, it, it's going to give us the weird two minus epsilon over epsilon minus one thing. I like to avoid that. I don't like those guys. So we're, we're just going to actually keep it as is. Okay. All right. So we have that now. Okay. So, so it, it, it tells us a little bit. Okay. Well, you know, let's keep that handy. All right. Um, now, if you remember from Ramsey world, we would, we would sort of take the growth rate of this equation and then, and then work with that instead. And, and that's what we're going to do here too. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to functionally, we're going to take the growth rate of this equation, which is going to produce some stuff, including a, a, a mu dot over mu. We're going to match that up with the mu dot over mu from the other side, eliminate mu, and then we'll be gold. All right. So that's the plan. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to preemptively lasso this. Yeah. And because we're going to, we're going to move on to a new page and I'm going to need it. So let's just copy it now. And then we can paste it later. All right. I just want, I'm looking for excuses to say, yeah, is, is, is the honest answer here. Okay. So, um, all right. So then we got that copied. Hopefully it sticks around on the clipboard. We got to go to, I don't know why, I don't even know why there are pages on this thing. This is an iPad with the infinite, you know, not infinite memory, but it's a, yeah, I don't, I, there's probably some option, but I haven't found it yet. Um, okay. So, all right. So we did the R thing. Now we need to do the state evolution equation. Okay. So I guess I forgot to mention what, what's our discount rate, you know, in the objective function. So we don't have population growth. Remember, we actually kind of can't have population growth here because we're in the five plus one knife edge case. If we had population growth, well then things would get out of control. All right. So um our our discount rate is really just row, literal row. Okay. Um so then we're gonna get rho times mu minus mu dot is equal to H N. Okay, remember uh you know our state variable is is actual n, right? And n dot is proportional to n. So you, you're picking up these n terms, but they're all going to cancel. So don't worry about it, all right? Um, so what are we going to get here? Well, uh, well, okay, you know, we do still need that objective function. That's why the pagination is annoying. So, so when we take a derivative with respect to n, we're going to get, you know, think about the, the Hamiltonian here. Sorry, I accidentally like zoomed. Uh, think about the Hamiltonian here. Um, we're going to get some u, u prime related term. Okay. And then we're going to get uh, mu gamma r. Okay. So um, let's, let's do that. I'm going to like cheat and look at the notes while I do this. All right. So we're going to, um, for that derivative with respect to n, we're going to get, well, first the, so the outer u prime of c. Okay. We're going to pick up a one minus R from the, from the chain rule, I guess. Um, and then we're going to get a derivative basically of N to the epsilon minus one. Okay. And so that's going to give you one over epsilon minus one times that original thing divided by N. Okay. So I'm, I'm sort of pathologically avoiding combining the N terms here because I know that they're going to cancel. But I could can't I could combine those n terms and it would be um you know two n to the two minus epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay, but but I'm I'm avoiding that. Okay. Um so that's that's and then so that's the first term, and then the second term, the derivative with respect to n is gonna be mu gamma r. Okay. That's what we got. All right, I'm gonna paste. I guess we don't we don't really have a sound effect for for unlassoing something so i don't know if you can think of one i'm open but uh i'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it free here on the second page and 36th page really um okay so then uh and so so that's what we have sort of in the background and then we just have derived this uh state equation here okay so with it, with these we can actually basically figure it all out okay so there's two things we're going to do. Okay, so one is we're going to we're going to take a growth rate of this equation in a minute. Okay? 
We're also going to use that equation on the right and sub it in on the left because this is a u prime of c, which we can eliminate um, fairly nicely uh, and then go from there. Okay, so if, if you look on the left hand side, okay, we have a u prime of c at n to the 1 over epsilon minus 1 over n. Okay, that whole thing should be equal to gamma mu. Okay, so at the end of the day, we're going to get gamma mu, 1 minus r, and then also 1 over epsilon minus 1. Okay, so, so plugging that left-hand side in, the other way you can think about it is plug in u prime n to the 1 over epsilon minus 1, you get gamma uh, mu n, the n's cancel. Okay, so you're going to get that. Wait. The ends cancel. So you just get you just get gamma. Sorry. So so that I believe is, is what is what we're left with. Okay. And you can see some familiar fractions, gamma over epsilon minus one showing up. That's not not a coincidence. Okay. So uh this we have on the left, and on the right, you still have mu gamma r. Okay. Um good. Okay, and that's what we Mu y indeed. Okay, that's yeah. The mu is going to be helpful there. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, that that way we that way the whole equation itself can be divided by mu. Yeah, and then get get a growth rate of mu, and then and then we're going to be all set. All right. So thank you. And uh, okay, so that's step one. Plug in into the state equation. Okay, which is a little different. That's that's sort of the main difference from Ramsey. Okay, is that we can we, we need to do that first simplification step. Okay, and then. Um, the, the right-hand side thing, like it kind of, you know, you can see that there's a common mu term, there's a common gamma term, and then there's some other stuff. Okay, so um, but we, we don't have to simplify it, though. I'm just going to leave it as is for now, okay? I, I am going to um, divide by mu, okay? That's, that's probably a good idea, all right? So let's do that. So we're going to get rho minus mu dot over mu is one let's let's factor out a gamma okay and then gamma and then we have sort of like one minus r or something minus one and then plus r okay and again if i were to combine those r terms i would get the dreaded two minus epsilon over epsilon minus one which we're not we're which ain't cool all right so we're, we're gonna keep it as is all right it's gonna it'll go away later all right um Okay, so that's that's sort of as simplified as I think we can do for now. All right, and then what we're going to do on the right hand side is take a growth rate, get something, get a, a, an expression basically for mu dot over mu, and then we're we're set. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay, so we can actually okay, we this is this is where we're gonna um we're gonna really use our growth rate rules. In their in their final form, okay. This is like this is like uh, if you've seen Dragon Ball Z, which perhaps you haven't. Uh, it's a, it's an anime featuring like people yelling and screaming and punching each other. This is like this is like the final form there. Ten thousand times gravity training. Okay, so what what can we do here if we want to if we want to operate in this in this we're we're operating in the logarithmic space if you want. Okay, um, so. Uh, so so in the logarithmic space, okay, if we take a growth rate of stuff, okay, remember how growth rates relate to elasticities, okay? So elasticities are like derivatives in growth rate land, okay? So if we take, if we're taking a growth rate of this equation on the right, then, well, first of all, we know we're, you know, the left-hand side is going to be the growth rate of the U prime of C term plus growth rate of n over epsilon minus one from sort of standard product rule and, and power rule. And then the right-hand side is going to be, you know, growth rate of mu plus growth rate of n. Okay. So you know that the, the thing where, we, where we're doing the, the, the super advanced logarithmic space thinking is what's the, uh, what's the growth rate of u prime of c? Well, it's just the elasticity of u prime at that point times the growth rate of c. Okay, that's that's the next level is is that you can actually work through 
sort of unknown functions in some sense um, and, and just operate directly in sort of growth rates and elasticities. Okay, so that's going to say, um, let me make sure I get this right. Yep, so, so that's going to give us elasticity of U prime times GC. Okay, plus G over epsilon minus one plus what, uh, mu dot over mu, so equals mu dot over mu plus g. Okay, so the right-hand side, you know, gamma's constant, it's just mu dot over mu plus g. Left-hand side, we got the n term, and then we have that, that u prime term, okay? Which it turns out is just, um, uh, yeah, epsilon u prime gc. Uh, I just need to decide if I'm putting a minus sign there. I believe I am not putting a minus sign there. Let me check the notes though. Um, minus, let's, let's try not putting a minus sign there and see what happens. Okay. So, um, but well, we, we can, we can, we can logic this. So if, if GC is growing, then U prime should be shrinking. Yeah, because we have decreasing marginal utility. Um, I'm thinking we want to put a minus in here. Okay, so because um, remember epsilon u is going to be theta. That's our CR. That's basically our CRA parameter. If we have CRA utility, I'm writing it generally here. Uh, that's going to be theta. Okay. So that would be a negative number, okay? Uh, or it's a, theta is a positive number, and so, but but in general, right? U prime is a decreasing function, okay? I My phone. I don't understand that. No, you don't. The whatever Siri analog for Android. Okay, Google. Um, I shouldn't say that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so so U prime is a decreasing function. If GC is growing, we would expect that to be shrinking. So we want a negative number there, okay? And if we're defining epsilon u prime to be a, a positive number by throwing another negative sign in there, then we should put a negative up front. Okay, so that's like a triple negative logic there, but basically it's a negative number and that's what we want, okay? Um, okay, so that's that's that. I guess um, let's let's throw in, let's just say that's equal to theta, okay? It's um, just easier. Okay, so we're, we're in CRA land now, okay? Um, Okay, so that's that's our growth rate equation there. All right, um, and all we have to do is is combine these two. All right, and then we'll be all set. So, uh, well, okay, we need to do that, and then we also need to worry a little bit about what is GC. Okay, but that's not so bad because we know that GC consumption is equal to output, so that's equal to GY, and we know you know GY is um, G, basically G over epsilon minus one. Okay, so that's not going to be that's not going to be so bad. All right, let me um, consult the notes here and make sure that I haven't led you too far astray. No, I think we're good. Okay, so um, yeah, so so we, we need to we need to combine these two now. Um, how should we do this? I don't know how should we do. Well, you know, so so this is saying. Let's say minus u dot over u is equal to g minus g over epsilon minus one plus theta gc. Okay. Um, and then we just need to plug that in. Okay. So I think in, in the notes, am I, I am, a, okay. So actually in the notes, I assumed log utility. Um, we don't need to though. Uh, this you know, it it it'll make it slightly more complicated to to keep the theta around. So so basically, if you look over here, this is g minus g over epsilon minus one plus theta. Now now so g c right is uh since since y is uh you know g p 
sorry, since y is p times n to the one over epsilon minus one, we know we know what g c and g y are. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. So the other thing, though, right, is that we have this steady. The question of are we going to assume steady state? Okay. Because because remember in general. Um, in general, I guess I'll just write here, you know, we had this, you know, y is equal to c is p times n to the one over epsilon minus one. So, so in general, we if we look at the growth rate of y, we're going to have a gp plus g over epsilon minus one. Okay, so that, that can be, um, you know, that's going to introduce a p dot term or an r dot term. Okay, just like we saw before. Okay, so... Let's let's stick with it, okay? But since I'm doing that, let's let's actually let's just do logarithmic growth, okay? So we're gonna we're gonna say theta equals one, okay? Um, and let's say that we just did that right here. So so we're we're doing theta equals one, uh, u is equal to log the log, okay? Just for simplicity, okay? Um, and then G C, okay? You know that's gonna be uh, G P plus G of epsilon minus one. Okay. Uh, the good thing about assuming log utility is that, that since that theta is one, those G of epsilon minus one terms cancel. Okay. So then we're going to get G plus G P. Okay. Um, all right, so then, so then we can plug that in and and get something, okay? Um, what are we gonna get? Uh, let's let's do it. Uh, so if we plug that in here on the left, okay. So we you know we basically have an expression for minus mu dot over mu over here on the right. Go over there, plug it on the left. Since it's a minus, we're gonna get you know plus g plus g p, okay. Um, Okay, and and so and on the right, you know, we're gonna get basically well, let's we're gonna let's factor it out gamma over epsilon minus one times one minus r, and then plus gamma r, which is actually which is actually g. This thing is g, gamma r. Okay, so that's those g's are gonna cancel basically. All right, so we're gonna get some more simplification here. Okay. Um, and then, and then, if you think about what's left, I mean, it's not so bad. It's rho, gp, and then gamma over epsilon minus one times one minus r. Okay, so so not the worst. Okay, and then we can also, you know, what is what is gp? That's p dot over p, or in other words, minus r dot over one minus r. Okay, so we get this, that's an R. Okay, so this is really, we have an equation purely in terms of R at this point, right? Um, yeah, so uh, let's see, we can, you know, what, and so what do we wanna do at this point? Okay, and I'm, I'm only have five minutes left, so I'm gonna go at a, a somewhat brisk pace here, but you, know, you can, uh, uh, all I'm doing really is just converting this into a quadratic form like we did last time. Okay, so uh, let's do that. All right, so so we're going to get, you know, basically r dot over 1 minus r is going to be rho minus gamma or epsilon minus 1. That's 1 minus r. Okay. Um, which is basically... Uh, you know, rho minus gamma over epsilon minus one plus gamma over epsilon minus r. Like that okay? Just factoring it out, okay? And then um, we can even do more, okay? And factor out that gamma over epsilon minus one, okay? So we'll get gamma over epsilon minus one times 
um, you know, uh, rho over gamma times epsilon minus one, minus one plus r. Okay, and I'm doing that so that we can get like an r minus r star sort of term. Okay, so then this is equal to gamma over epsilon minus one times r minus, there's a minus sign there, uh, that term, which is going to be r star. Okay, so oops, that shouldn't be a minus sign. I was wrong. Uh, r minus basically one minus rho over gamma times epsilon minus one. Okay. All right, so then, um, okay, and that that's what we're going to call r star. And it, it is r star, okay? Uh, so at the end of the day, we're left with this. We have r dot is equal to 1 minus r uh, gamma over epsilon minus 1 times r minus r star. Okay? Wherein r star is equal to 1 minus rho over gamma. Okay, so we have some r star. Okay, our, our, our law of motion for r dot, okay, is some quadratic form for that okay and i'll you know uh, i think just to get an idea of the shape it's best to to write it like this okay so some uh, downward facing quadratic form okay that has roots at one in our star okay um and that and i guess actually the the in the notes i'm writing it as our hat to differentiate it from the equilibrium, which is our star. So let's say our hat is uh, is our, our efficient social planner outcome level of R. Our star is the equilibrium. Okay, so we're, I'll just do our hat. Okay, so it's got roots at one and our hat. Okay, uh, but otherwise, you know, it's going to look similar to to before. It's just the the definition of our hat is is different. Okay, so here's one. We have a root here. We have our hat. You know, not equal to our star necessarily. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to have something like this, and it's still going to impact zero and so on. Okay, so so the basic shape is the same, that negative quadratic, it's unstable. Okay, you get the same implications uh, on the right-hand side. You have, well, possibly or whatever whatever we, we decide there, uh, some transversality issues. Either way, weird, weird stuff where you get no production labor happening. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, you actually impact uh, R equals zero and go to infeasible uh places okay so so that's you know, the the basic derivation is the same okay um and so you know your equilibrium is sort of going to be immediately start at our hat and stay there forever okay now this our hat up here that's sort of like the main result um is is different okay uh from the uh our star that we found, okay? And hence G hat, it's gonna be different from G star, okay? So we have a difference between the socially efficient outcome and the equilibrium outcome, okay? Um, and it, it turns out in general, you're gonna have more research happening in the socially efficient outcome versus the equilibrium, which is to say there's an underinvestment in research in, in equilibrium, okay? So so that's it, okay, I'm out of time now. Um, basically, you know, go through self social planning problem, not as bad, Still kind of tricky, but not as bad as, as the full equilibrium, okay? Um, and then you can get this under investment. So we'll go into, okay, we'll it, you know, show this under investment, show the nature of it and why it happens next time, okay? But know that it's there, all right? Uh, okay, cool. Um, see you guys on uh, Thursday, all right? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah and uh, watch, watch that Canyon Arrow episode on The Simpsons. And I'll, I'll maybe I'll have my uh, soundboard set up by then uh, next time.